This afternoon we'll be hearing from Carrie Roberts, who is uh, Associate Dean of the Arts and Sciences at Liberty University. He's also Chair of the History Department there. And Dr. Roberts is an expert in Jefferson and American history. Um, and we will be hearing from him on the history of progressivism and its relationship to crony capitalism. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here once again. You know, serious discussion of combating crony capitalism often raises more questions than it will answer. For example, what is crony capitalism? Who are the cronies? Is it best to start with small examples like subsidized, bankrupt solar energy companies? Or begin with a single largest example of cronyism, the transfer payments of, of national um, social s services? Or where should we start? The federal level, in localities, or in state governments? Dealing with crony capitalism at an intellectual level also carries an, an unspoken apocalyptic argument. Cronyism circumvents constitutional government, corrupts otherwise healthy political institutions, and turns America's free market paradise into a discredited open target for socialists. This seems to be the argument that many opponents of crony capitalism make. All is doomed, and there's nothing we can do about it short of the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> now, if I may use theological terms here, many conservatives and libertarian critics of crony capitalism, not to mention some pundits on the left, have a kind of, of premillennial approach to capitalism. It was great when it started, but as time progressed, human sinfulness and the increased complexity of American society made free market capitalism either obsolete or impossible to function on a larger scale. In other words, the cronies are going to win because capitalism is in a, a kind of downward spiral. And I emphasize this because it, it is, I think, something that conservatives often fall into, that there was a time in which there was a golden age of American capitalism, and we have slipped further and further away from that golden age as the 20th century progressed. And it's an important narrative that I would wish, wish to address at the beginning of this presentation. I think free market sentiments, uh, free market economists, excuse me, are partly to blame for this sentiment. Adam Smith pointed to the endless array of merchants seeking special privilege under Britain's navigation laws, as did a number of noted conservative Whigs in Great Britain from the, from the Duke of Newcastle to Edmund Burke. French liberals from Turgot to Frederick Bastier recognized the influence of business that businessmen had on French politics. It seemed to have been an unending quest on their part to enrich themselves at the public's expense. Libertarian economists, including the likes of Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises and Frederick von Hayek, as well as Milton Friedman, now, the, the big three in libertarian uh, economics of the 20th century, often pointed to the incentives that businessmen had when passing their costs on to other people in a process that, that, that recent economists like to refer to as externalizing externalities. Have y'all got to that point yet? <laughs> Um, perhaps most important for any discussion of crony capitalism is the pioneering work of public choice economists like James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, who, uh, whose studies examined in minute detail the convergence of interest between business and government. Uh, they called this rent seeking, we call it cronyism. This is all to say that many of the most celebrated liberal and libertarian and classically liberal economists portrayed capitalism as a, sort of a, a, 
always under threat. There was always an effort by others to circumvent its, its, its benefits, to thwart its underlying assumptions, and to take the system of prosperity it created to simply enrich themselves at the expense of others. We see this throughout leading uh, economic writings of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. Hence, we have this vision that capitalism uh, is, 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 is always uh, in danger of being lost, or otherwise, capitalism is, is in, in decline. Now, if care is not taking, many of these interpretations belie a myth that assumes the United States enjoyed, as I said earlier, a golden era of free market capitalism. According to this mistaken narrative, the American colonists grew sick of the British Crown's efforts to control their trade and tax their livelihood. They threw off their imperial shackles, and under the watchful gaze of George Washington, the framers of the Constitution created a free market order. They left unfinished the one great task of removing from the country the blot of slavery, which served as a constant reminder that America was still not the free market society the framers intended. Thankfully, Abraham Lincoln and other apostles of free markets led us through the Civil War so that free market principles like liberty, equality, and fraternity uh, could thrive and thus make 19th century America, at least the last half of 19th century America, that golden age to, wish, to which we all wish we could return. There is actually little about this narrative that is true. Most colonists in the 18th century cared more about controlling the machinations of their colonial assemblies than they did the workings of the navigation laws, which probably touched them very um, up seldom. Many of the leading patriots hardly championed free markets, and some even hoped that by leaving the British Empire, they, could, they would be able to create their own visions of mercantilism uh, here at home. The framers of the Constitution, and most importantly, framers of state constitutions in the late 18th century, effectively stumbled into creating a national and local political system that allowed for the flourishing of the American economy. It was not necessarily planned to be that way. This occurred as much by unintended consequences and perhaps even more from the accidental convergence of a wide variety of conflicting interests who agreed for once in the 1780s and early 90s to leave each other alone. And to claim that Abraham Lincoln, whose expertise as a corporate lawyer was only exceeded by his ability to get the Illinois legislature to reward his friends with lucrative transportation contracts, somehow fulfilled the promise of creating free markets is, is spurious at best. That argument only works with those who, after reading one professor's book and five or six political speeches, proclaim themselves to be experts on political theory. To be clear, there, there was no golden age of American capitalism. There was no era when crony capitalism did not exist. It is, as I'll say again in a moment, it is the default position, which should be the proper reading of, of what I think most classical liberal economists are trying to teach us, uh, whether it was Adam Smith all the way up to the present, that the default position is crony capitalism. It's those who break away from that who are truly exceptional. But simply because cronyism is the default position should not mean that there is no hope in either mollifying its pernicious character or one day eliminating the incentives that make it possible. One should not lose hope.
My purpose here is to, to briefly look at at least one important decade. Um, not the 1920s, as time permits, I'll get to the 1920s, but I want to look at one decade which I think really um, um, it illustrates the key issues that we face with crony capitalism, defining what it is, and offering a remedy. And that decade is the 1820s. It will help us, I believe, to understand why cronyism often wins and also help us to understand why cronyism will lose and did lose on a number of occasions. Uh, following this, we'll go in and we'll talk about the early 20th century and the, the progressives of the 19-teens and the 1920s. Now, I'm, I'm making this argument about a, a century earlier, the 1820s, for a very important reason. I want to lay that out right now. And that is, there is an argument popular among um, um, some American conservatives and some American libertarians that the progressives of the early 20th century were, were new. That they appeared on the American scene because of new ideas imported from Europe in the late 19th century, notably Darwinian evolution and uh, German ideas about the modern state. That had it not been for uh, German Hegelians teaching Marxists, who then taught early, uh, excuse me, uh, taught American um, um, uh, graduate students in the late 19th century, that American progressivism would not have arrived on the scene. In other words, there is an interpretation out there that the ideas of the progressives were new and what they were trying to achieve was new and unique to this period from roughly 1890 to 1920 or 1930. Um, that, that, is an, that is an incorrect position. And it is a position of political theorists. Uh, it's not a position of historians. Um, most historians agree that what the progressives were trying to do were roughly, was roughly the same thing that uh, early 19th century Americans were trying to do, especially those who were part of the National Republican Movement, the Whig uh, party, the American Whig Party, and then later the, the, the second Republican Party. Um, keep in mind that Jefferson's Republican Party was not the same Republican Party we have today. So the second Republican Party, which I'm referring to, uh, which began in the 1850s. So, the, so I'm, I'm making this point because I want you to understand that what Woodrow Wilson and Richard Ely and a host of other progressive intellectuals were trying to achieve was in part exactly what Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, and Daniel Webster were trying to achieve in the antebellum period. It was not something that, that came by. We, we blame the Germans for a lot of things, but uh, probably not this one. And the German, German intellectuals certainly carried forward a lot of these same sentiments, but it was not something that they were responsible for. Now, over the course of American history, um, there are a few decades that stand out because of their turbulent social and political circumstances. But it is a mistake to assume that all of American history is just a, a bunch of conflict. Um, Americans, by and large, have enjoyed mellow times over the course of our history than we have um, periods of intense political, if not violent, conflict. We have experienced relatively little political conflict when compared to moderns in, in the European continent. In our own lifetimes, uh, we may consider the Great Depression of the 1930s or the radicalism of the 1960s to identify periods of social unrest and contentiousness. Um, however, um, during those decades, very few communities actually ceased to exist. It was not a period in which there was overwhelming disaster. But we can find periods like that in American history. We could talk about the 1620s. 
the very beginning of colonization when literally communities were wiped out that uh, and others that had they not been wiped out none of us would be, be standing here today. We could talk about the 1770s in the, in, during the War of Independence or the 1860s during the Civil War. Uh, maybe even to the lesser extent the early 18 teens with the War of 1812. These are periods in which really bad things happen in the United States. These are periods in which there is, there is there's widespread violence and breakdown of political institutions. Uh, the 1930s and the 1960s uh, would pale in comparison to these decades. But I do want to focus then on the 1820s themselves. And before I get to the 1820s, um, I want to provide you a little bit of context, a little bit of historical circumstances that, that related to this period. And in doing so, I want to address this question, how is it that crony capitalism can be said to be the default position of the early American economy? Well, here's how it normally worked. Companies uh, in the 18th century, companies were chartered directly by the crown of Great Britain for the purpose of enriching the political benefactors of the royal government uh, to, establish, to establish colonies. Now we think of the, the Pilgrims and the Puritans and the Huguenots and the Quakers, uh, Roman Catholics and other religious groups that are migrating over to North America. We think about them pursuing religious freedom, but we fail to remember what it is that actually got them across the Atlantic. And it was not a quest for religious liberty, it was a quest for profit. All of these expeditions were sponsored by companies. Royally chartered companies that were established because the people who were shareholders in those comp companies had close personal connections with the British Crown. Uh, or in the case of some other uh, countries and new, with New France, uh, connections to the, to the French Crown. Um, nonetheless, um, those who bankrolled these settlements expected a profit. And when profits failed to materialize, they often went to government for assistance. Now, about the time of the War of Independence, the power of chartering these companies had begun to transfer from the crown itself to assemblies, colonial assemblies, to the British Parliament. And then by the end of the 18th century, the power of chartering companies was transferred to state legislatures. And for the United States' first uh, corporations, those who got a charter from a state legislature went through a long, tedious process of being granted special privilege by their well-placed friends in the legislature. That's how you got it. You did not go to a Secretary of State's office and fill out a piece of paper requesting a corporate charter. You had to know somebody or you had to pay somebody off. That would give you entrance into the state legislature. A friend of yours or someone who was associated with you would propose that you be granted a charter and the legislature would often have to vote on this. And each time the vote was made, the assumption was the person getting the charter or the company getting the charter would have some kind of special privilege. That per we call that person a crony today. Back then they called it a good citizen. Because this was someone that the legislature supposedly was sure could build a transportation improvement like a canal or a bridge that would benefit the general public. And they would get a monopoly either on trade or a right of passage in a given area. So I might get, and I'm, I'm, obviously this is much later in time, but I might get a charter for a ferry company to navigate the Film Osage River west of here, or a, or a, a, a ferry to navigate the Mississippi River um, uh, in St. Louis. I would have a monopoly on a certain amount of land, a certain area in which I alone had the right to run a ferry across the river. 
Now, this is the way things were done. This was not something exceptional, but it was clearly a transfer payment. The legislature would argue that this person was enriching the entire area because only he would build this ferry line if he was guaranteed to have a monopoly on trade. So monopolies, cronyism, rent seeking, transfer, whatever we want to call it, it's all uh, hand in hand. Now, sometimes the charters worked in the public's interest. Most times they did not. Indeed, a few early American charters um, required, as they, as they were passed by the state legislature, they required the conscription of human labor, whereby local townspeople were forced to provide their labor in the dangerous work of building bridges or canals. This is sometimes often missed, uh, but it was particularly true in New England, uh, New England states like Rhode Island, where if you got a charter to build a bridge across a, 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 a little stream or a river, you would actually be able to go into the area and con with, the, with the help of local authorities, conscript the labor of townspeople to come out and build the bridge for you. Now you would pay their life, you would pay for it, they're not slaves. You would, be able, you would have to give them some money, but this is how corporations worked. This was seen to be um, you know, a, a healthy way of promoting economic development. There are no free markets. There was no laissez-faire. There were no free market libertarians supported by wealthy businessmen who simply wanted to be left alone. Instead, by the early 19th century, politicians and capitalists enjoyed an interesting partnership. And I wish to emphasize to each of you, the genuine entrepreneur, the person who did not follow this pattern, the person who was not a crony, that person was the exception to the rule and became the stuff of American legend. The reason we think today about Robert Fulton or Cornelius Vanderbilt or Paul Revere or other leading uh, early American entrepreneurs is precisely because they did not do what everyone else was doing. Or in the case of Fulton, they did not do initially in their career what everyone else was doing. <clears throat> so the basis of our popular memory of these, of, of these great American entrepreneurs is not because they were indicative of what was going on in the rest of American society. It was because they were an exception, an exception to the rule. Now, until the early antebellum period, and apart from planters and retail merchants, chances were that what we call today businessmen readily connected with local politicians to build roads, bridges, canals, turnpikes, even factories. Again, I emphasize this was simply how things worked. If you were going to um, risk your capital building a factory, you wanted guarantees from the politicians that there would be sufficient demand to make your factory profitable. Hence, the pressure on national politicians to impose and raise protective tariffs on foreign trade. This was a guarantee offered to those businessmen to make sure that the risk they were taking were transferred to the, the rest of the population. Uh, <clears throat> now, something began to change though. In the early 19th century, the lowly shopkeeper lived, frankly, a lowly existence. He reaped meager profits and he commanded little respect among his uh, fellow citizens. In fact, it was quite common in the antebellum South that if you were a merchant and you made uh, a significant amount of money, you wanted to cease being a merchant as fast as you could and become a planner. Uh, the ideal was to not be a merchant or a banker 
or even a physician, the ideal was to be a planter who was sort of separated to some extent from this local give and take of, 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 of patronage that, that typically went on. Now all of that began to change by the time we got to the 1820s. Again, this all-important decade. And it began to change for a number of reasons, one of which was a political framework that had been established um, uh, by the framers of the Constitution and by the framers of state governments and was played out and in distinctly Jeffersonian and federal terms. Um, by deliberately restraining political power to promote human flourishing, Jeffersonian Republicans were able to unleash a new era of, of capitalist development. And this is not a golden age, it's not a genuine free market. And um, there, there is some question as to whether these politicians really were trying to create a free market. What they were trying to do was to restrain power. But the inevitable result was that by restraining political power, it curtailed the ability of any politician from saying to entrepreneurs, stop, do not do this any longer. Now, under this constitutional vision of the, of the Jeffersonians, politics would not be the supreme power in society. And I think if we needed to summarize Jeffersonian political theory, that's what it would be. No person or institution would be able to exercise supreme authority. But neither would a religious denomination or a specific region of a state or a politically influential family, or even a newspaper be capable of exercising complete cultural dominance. So to meet their goals, Jeffersonians across the United States disestablished churches. Now the last will uh, actually occur in New England uh, by the, the 1830s and 1840s. They will move state capitals and this occurred throughout the eastern seaboard. Uh, capitals were moved from large seaboard cities where influential families were able to control state legislatures and enrich themselves at the public's expense. And so uh, uh, state capitals were moved inland from Charleston to Columbia, from Natchez, Mississippi, on the Mississippi River to Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, this happened in the north, it happened in the south, it happened th th throughout the country. Uh, it's an important event that many people uh, really seldom look at very closely, but moving those state capitals was an effort to undermine cronyism. Sort of makes you wonder if maybe moving some of our capitals today might do the same. <clears throat> now the old guard reacted to maintain the status quo whenever their cultural privilege or political patronage and economic development were, were, were threatened. They had continued throughout the history of the Jeffersonian political movement from the 1790s through the 1830s to make sure that these efforts were undermined. In fact, we could even go back a little bit further and claim that one reason why the Articles of Confederation, the very first Constitution of the United States, suffered from a lack of elite support was because it was so difficult to establish a relationship between government and business, between cronies and their patrons, especially among the largest companies of the late 18th century, which were, which were land companies. The, the, the largest opposition to the Articles of Confederation came from people connected to uh, land companies. Hmm. We're back to the 18 uh, teens and 1820s. After the War of 1812, the United States Congress um, embarked upon one of the most ambitious efforts of our history to expand federal and state control over the national economy. The goal was to energize the economy, to rejuvenate it and reinvigorate it after the destruction of the war. 
And please, let's not forget the kind of destruction that actually occurred in the War of 1812. Some of you probably remember that. Uh, what was burned during the War of 1812? Washington, D.C. was burned. I mean, you can't get much worse than that. I and mean, if you really want to go after a nation's ego, burn down its capital. Um, <clears throat> Well, the 18 teens witnessed the passage of protective tariffs, federal highway and transportation programs. Well, they didn't call it highways back then. It's what we would call it today. And the country's first official central bank, the second bank of the United States. Politicians justified some of these efforts under the guise of expanding the country's largest employer and through, uh, which was throughout the 19th century, the largest employer of, of, in the United States, um, and that was the United States Postal Service. At the state and local level, politicians passed similar efforts, only at a smaller scale. So the idea was we build roads and that will allow us to uh, carry the mail. If we can carry the mail, then we can expand the number of, of major uh, contributors to our campaigns and major supporters of our campaigns. There'll be more people getting federal postal contracts. If there's more patronage to go around. That means there's going to be more people who are going to be printing campaign uh, articles on behalf of our particular party. So you expand the postal service, you expand the patronage, you expand the patronage, you better guarantee your re-election or, or election in the upcoming um, um, season cycle. Um, in fact, the decade of the 18-teens, right after the War of 1812, witnessed the first broad attempts to regulate the moral climate of the country with restrictions upon the westward spread of slavery and some early uh, moral crusades like the temperance movement that would, that would blossom over the next decade. Those of you who don't know what temperance is, this was uh, the 19th century word of preventing the consumption of alcohol. So, we come out of the War of 1812 and the United States Congress and many of its most vocal politicians are bent on invigorating the economy with massive schemes of patronage, of, of raising protective tariffs, of forcing industrialization, of rewarding their political supporters, of controlling the country's money supply, of aggrandizing through the second bank of the United States the operation of state banks and a whole series of transportation improvements. Now we think of the New Deal of the 1930s as being a, a significant effort to control the economy. But I'd like for you to consider the 18 teens in a similar fashion. In fact, it was very popular in the 1940s and 50s by historians to actually compare what Franklin Roosevelt was doing in the 30s to what was going on in this period of time in, in the country, in the, in the teens and 20s and 30s. Well, something happened. Something happened on the eve of the 1820s that brought this entire effort to a screeching halt. And much like uh, we were reminded this morning, what occurred was economic collapse. We call it the Panic of 1819 when the United States economy plunged to record low levels under the weight of the federal government and state government's misallocation of economic resources. It's unsustainable. Cronyism's unsustainable. It will crash. In this case, it did. Uh, the economy collapsed. Um, uh, well, let's put it this way. As long as the economy runs smoothly, Americans cared little about government waste, taxes, or any form of crony cronyism. It's the way things work, it's the way things have always been. Why should we upset the system that seems to be doing fine? But let the economy collapse and people start raising questions. And it, was, it occurred at precisely the time that Jeffersonian politicians provided answers. Here's a second point that I'm hoping to make with you. First was that the entrepreneurs that we uh, cherish were exceptions to the rule. The second main point that I'd like to uh, get across to you is that if you're there with the answers, when economic collapse 
forces people to ask the right questions, you have a greater probability of political success. You've got to be prepared to provide the right answers when people ask the right questions. And that's exactly what Jeffersonian Republican politicians had done. They had um, um, offered a rather colorful cast of leading characters to make their arguments. Led by the shrill-voiced John Randolph of Virginia, who because of a high fever uh, uh, late in his childhood, he was robbed uh, of puberty. Uh, John Randolph, with his shrill voice and langley features, uh, would point his finger across the halls of Congress looking at those who sponsored cronyism and, and calling them out. Uh, he would also bring his dogs, his hunting dogs, to the floor of Congress so that as he's delivering his speech, here's the pounds down on his feet and uh, uh, you know, no one wanted to get up and, and challenge him. Unless you were Henry Clay, I guess so, but anyway. Others included Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina, John Calhoun of South Carolina, former President Thomas Jefferson himself, President James Monroe, John Taylor of Virginia, and a host of others, all of whom challenged the cozy relationship between government and business. Now, that's the context of going into the 1820s. You have an economic collapse, you have a severe panic, or what we would call today a recession. You have people, normal people like you and I and our family and friends now asking the right question, which is why are we in this economic plight? And the Jeffersonians are there offering the, the answers. Now, there's one thing before we, we explain what these answers are. And that is how to Americans get this information. And I, I think it's a, a rather fun story for you to understand that in the 18 teens and 1820s, Americans uh, enjoyed one of the highest rates of literacy in our history. Americans read and they read newspapers. Now newspapers in this period of time were not like our newspapers today where you have journalists who provide descriptions of, of key events. In this period of time, and I think it's kind of ironic, um, um, politicians would reward their supporters with, 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 with publishing contracts. Somebody had to publish the proceedings of the debates in state legislatures and in Congress. And so they would find a political supporter and they would say, all right, you have won my contract for the, cause, because our party has won the election. You're going to get to publish all of the debates that are being held in this legislature or in Congress. You're going to be able to use that money then to you know, help, help yourself out. You'll probably get a few mail contracts and postal contracts and all will be well. Which means that what newspapers contained were the speeches of politicians. Now let that sink in just for a moment. Americans read newspapers more than anything else, probably read newspapers more than they did a Bible. And they're reading the speeches of politicians. Imagine the pressure that these poor politicians are under to make sense and to provide arguments that people can actually evaluate. I mean, it's pretty hard to, to tell lies if everybody's listening to you because you've got to make sure the lies are consistent to a large number of people. And so this is sort of a, it may not be a golden era of capitalism, but it is a golden era of American political oratory. This is the world in which Abraham, Abraham Lincoln was born. This is the world created by John Randolph, by Daniel Webster, by John Calhoun, by Henry Clay. This is the world in which Americans listened to politicians and politicians provided detailed philosophical and intellectual reasons for what it is they were trying to pass in that legislature or Congress. There are no speech writers. 
There are no uh, cameras. There are no pundits waiting to make commentary on the latest uh, 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 bill going through the House of Representatives. Congressmen had to do all of that themselves, and they had to make sense. So the decades of the 1820s really did involve competing sets of ideas most of which reflected genuine philosophical curiosity that were shaped by real political interests. In other words, these politicians didn't just spout abstract political rhetoric. They, 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 they meant what they said. Now let me, let me speed through here a few interesting aspects of this, these debates in the 1820s. Um, because there are two sides of this. This decade represented a period in which United States congressmen literally debated deep philosophical issues related to economic calculation, how entrepreneurs make decisions, the dissemination of knowledge and economic information, and the role of government incentives. They actually talk about this on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And it's not that someone's sitting there handing them articles that they then quote. These people are thinking on their feet. They have read this material. They have thought deeply on these subjects. And they're talking about it on the cuff. Uh, many are giving extemporaneous presentations or speeches. They're not just uh, uh, having someone else write the speech for them, which I find absolutely Absolutely fascinating. In fact, <clears throat> professional economists would not get around to fully debating these kinds of issues for another hundred years in what we now call the socialist calculation debate of the 1920s. American politicians dealt with nearly every aspect of the debate we call the socialist calculation debate in the halls of Congress five generations before German and Austrian and British economists got around to bringing these things up. The discussion of American congressmen centered on a variety of key policies among which were protective tariffs, trade agreements, central banking, monetary policy, separation of powers, slavery, bankruptcy laws, states' rights, even spreading democratic institutions to foreign lands, like Greece. Sound, sound familiar? Supporters of cronyism used a wide variety of arguments, but I believe there were four major themes to these. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I want to at least tell you what these themes were. Number one, they argued about the moral superiority of the right people being in charge. Not everybody ought to be in charge, just the right people. This was almost always couched in regional and class terms. In other words, it was almost always the case that, 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 that advocates of cronyism claimed there were certain parts of the country where there were smart people, people who knew how to build factories, people who knew how to run the machine of American society, and these are the people who should be trusted with those tasks. After all, we know that the New England brooks run with cool, clear water while the mountains of Virginia stank with swamps, moonshine, and whiskey. A second thing that cronies um, maintained was the inevitability of American progress. Again, in almost every major debate that took place in the 1820s, um, advocates of greater uh, political control insisted that progress would be inevitable if we just allowed Congress to pass this bill or if we would just allow the state legislature to pass this bill, whatever it may be. A third thing. Is, was, was the divine mission of the United States. In other words, um, uh, time and time again, uh, 
Congressmen invoked the blessings of God, insisted that America was unique, and argued that only by allowing controlled economic growth and development could the United States truly achieve its divine mission in the world. The only way we were going to become what God wanted us to become is if we raised protective tariffs or if we built a road from uh, Western Virginia through the middle of Kentucky. You know, going by Henry Clay's plantation would be you know, even, even more angelic. Anyway, um, and fourth, um, and this may be the most important, was an insistence that American society be treated as a machine rather than a collection of communities and societies. That it be treated as a machine, that it looks like a machine. Politicians like Henry Clay of Kentucky often characterized America as a system that required a delicate construction so that each part of the machine would fit together in just the right way as to benefit uh, everyone involved. In other words, we could take the United States, peel off certain parts, reconfigure those parts like some giant Lego set. If it, if it weighs too much on one side, we just pull off the bricks and we attach them in the, uh, the other side to, to bring out some sort of economic balance. It's a machine. It was not something that, we, that, that was unpredictable. It was not something that was um, um, uh, the production of human imagination, trust, cooperation, and communal ties. It was something that could be changed at will. And whoever had the courage and the power to, to build the machine were the ones that should be entrusted with the power of, of controlling that machine. Now let me give a few examples of this. In 1824, Joseph Hemphill of Pennsylvania uh, proposed a General Survey Act. He wanted the federal government to at least have the ability to survey for uh, transportation improvements, to build roads. Hemphill argued that there is no country capable of higher improvements than this nor any society of people to whom such a measure would be of greater advantage. We were special. We were the best. George Holcomb of New Jersey believed federal sponsorship of transportation would do for the country what the steamboat achieved for Robert Fulton. Quote, we are destined to transverse the ocean itself for the purposes of commerce with an alacrity there unto unprecedented and unimagined conquering time and space and drawing together within the circle of social and national intercourse the remote and scattered families of the human race. 20th century progressives were, were not as ambitious as men like George Holcomb. Weeks later in 1824, Henry Clay defended the raising of protective tariffs by insisting, quote, but my idea is the happiness of a nation is the happiness of the several parts that compose it. That the protection of the several parts of a nation is the protection of the nation. And when Jeffersonians lamented how the protective tariff would clearly transfer wealth from one section of the country to another, Henry C. Martindale of New York, and father of a future Union general, John Martindale, boasted, and I'll quote here at length, we are but one people, sir. We have but one country, a great and a good one which our forefathers won for us and have bequeathed to us. In other words, we have one machine that we're all a part of. As far as our powers and official capacities extend, we have but one government, the government of this great empire, one and indivisible. <clears throat> Martindale then brought up um, a few other things and argued, let us be Americans and feel and act as Americans. Let us feel that we have a country and let those feelings embrace the whole of it. There is one sacred, invariable, 
enduring principle of our government, which is that no portion of our country can ever violate with impunity, and that is, it can never violate the majority. The majority must govern. Their decisions must prevail, and the minority must submit. In other words, for many of these advocates of cronyism, they insisted that a majority wanted cronyism, and anyone who protested against this was un-American. In fact, uh, Martindale, when pressed um, uh, why Americans should, should suffer under so much taxation for the benefit of the few, he argued those who benefit are men. Men are people. And for others to oppose benefits going to people meant people were trying to violate themselves. This was treasonous. In fact, he used the R, they used the word. This is, it is treason for the minority to oppose the transfer of, of, of money from themselves to some other even smaller group. Treason. Now, for the sake of time, I wish to push, push forward. What is it that the Jeffersonians said against this sort of reasoning? What is it that they argued that, that undermined the special privileges that people claim God had given us, that undermined the inevitability of, of American progress, that had undermined the moral superiority of the right people, meaning those who vote for the majority, or undermined the argument that America was a system, a machine, that when placed in the right order would benefit everyone. The person that I believe did the most to discredit these, these myths was a little known Virginian by the name of Philip Barber. Philip Barber was from one of Virginia's most prominent families. In fact, his brother James uh, went on to be a, be a cabinet official. And on March 26, 1824, which is an important date, March 26, 1824, not because we're almost about to celebrate it, but because uh, he took to the floor and he announced, and I, I will quote him at length, but some of my doctrines is this that the wealth of a nation is an aggregate of the wealth of the individuals who compose it. This is as plain a principle as that the whole is made up of the parts, that there is an instinct pl implanted in man, the master spring of his actions, which through life impels him to a perpetual endeavor to better his condition. That this principle acting alike upon all, without concern, without even looking to the public interest, every man in society is constantly endeavoring to increase his portion of wealth. And consequently, every man is laboring to add to the stock of public, public wealth, an increase of a whole being the inevitable result of an increase of its individual parts. He went on to argue Quote, before then it could be justified to invoke the aid of government upon this subject, it is incumbent upon those who would do so to prove that government knows better how to direct this desire, which all acknowledge to be universal, that the individual themse uh, citizens uh, themselves know what is best. This they cannot do, but on the contrary, I think it can be clearly shown not only that government does not know better, but that it does not so well. Nay, that in the nature of things it is and must be wholly incompetent to the task. Furthermore, I could furnish a practical exemplification of our incompetency to the, this task, drawn from the impossibility of answering each of the questions which I have put. It's a long sentence. Sorry about that. 19th century. Um, these will illustrate the truth which I am contending, namely, that the proposed system, as it is without our sphere of action, so it is beyond the government's means of information. <laughs> But whilst we are thus without the necessary information, 
as to all these complicated subjects, each individual in his own immediate and separate pursuit has or may have all the information required in relation to his business. To individuals then let us leave it with the assurance that as they have the desire to give their capital and labor the most profitable direction, so they must much more surely find out that application than we can. In other words, Philip Barber argues what people will win Nobel Prizes for in the, in the 20th century. This is in the United States Congress. This is a long time ago. What did the, what, let me finish, close by saying this, what is it that the Jeffersonians were able to do? They provided answers when Americans asked the right questions. They understood the nature of economics. They understood the, 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 the detailed nature of the American economy. They understood that individuals and entrepreneurs alone possessed the, the kind of information needed to promote human flourishing. And that this information was limited. That it was not something that could be understood in the aggregate, nor was it something that was at the hands of any politician's beck and call. In other words, the Jeffersonian Republicans changed the rules. They changed the rules that Americans thought governed their economy. The Jeffersonian Republicans changed the rules that, the, the rule that cronyism would be the default position. From the 1820s forward, Americans began to question this. They began to argue that perhaps it was not necessary to reward a few at the expense of the many. And so what we began seeing throughout antebellum America was a series of, of economic reforms that allowed for the regularization of American business practices. For example, at the state level, we began creating Secretary of State's offices that issued generic corporate charters. Everyone who met certain criteria and paid a fee got a charter. No longer did you have to go buy off your, 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 your nemesis uh, uh, best buddy in the legislature. No longer did you have to go and win the support of several politicians. Instead, you knew how much it would cost, you went to an office, you filled out a form, and you were granted a charter. And so uh, American businesses became regularized, and the cost of creating those businesses and corporations was drastically reduced. So you have a flourishing of new corporations beginning in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Politicians were not even empowered to say stop. In fact, by the 30s and 40s, several states began enacting constitutional amendments, which restricted state legislatures from offering cronyistic uh, uh, incentives. Some states prevented, some constitutions were rewritten to prevent legislatures from issuing debt, for example. Others were rewritten and amended so that legislatures specifically could not charter corporations. Others were were uh, amended to allow for uniform bankruptcy laws so that no longer would it be the case that your, your best friend could uh, bail you out because you were in, he was in the legislature and, and could help you. Now, if you met certain criteria, you could declare bankruptcy and go on to, to start a new business and, and, and when, when the, those, those risks proved um, uh, unprofitable. The 18, excuse me, the 19 teens and the 1920s were not too different from this period. We have a series of other major initiatives by progressives to create a national framework for the economy. Passage of the Federal Reserve Act, uh, antitrust legislation, uh, efforts to control monetary policy, efforts to produce um, uh, regulations on uh, hygiene, sanitation, and um, uh, uh, factory uh, labor conditions, all of which 
were, were largely um, um, moral in their, 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 their public arguments, but privately were designed to enrich uh, specific groups of people and protect them from their competitors. What better way to protect big meat packers in the early 20th century than imposing very costly um, uh, sanitation requirements on the entire industry but which smaller packers could ill afford to uh, take into account. In other words, you simply pass the costs on to your small competitors and you're sure to be um, 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 uh, all um, um, a much more profitable company. Uh, well, let me end by saying this, kind of bring this to a close. The world of cronyism is facing once more a crisis, not unlike what it faced in the, in the Panic of 1819, uh, not unlike some of the crises that it faced, uh, the repercussions of World War I, not unlike the Great Depression. Progressivism and its connection to crony capitalism is, under, is now being challenged. And it's being challenged, by and large, by the decentralization of information and knowledge. It's being challenged by the effects of the internet, by microprocessors. I don't want to just say the internet because there's a lot of other things that have gone into this that have made portable computing and you know, other kinds of devices possible. We now live in a period in which Americans realize that the arguments of Hemphill and Holcomb and Clay that we are all one nation is, is uh, considered futile at best. Whether it be Ferguson, Missouri, the Occupy New York movement, Oklahoma's uh, ongoing attempt to nullify Obamacare, or the, the rise of social networking. All of these point to one staggering fact. America is federalizing once again. Americans are prepared to listen to the ideas that will, that will answer the questions they are beginning to ask. We are not one country. We are not one society. To oppose the will of a majority is not treasonous. To argue that a homogenized national solution to our deep social problems is no longer questioned or no longer attributed to be the argument of quacks or those who might wear tinfoil on their head. Or, or, it's not just an alliance between left and right over economic issues that we need. It's not just an alliance between left and right against crony capitalism that we need. It is an alliance between left and right that the worst of our social problems cannot be solved by national policy. It is a recognition that the kinds of virtues that, that our society now demands of us is that we must solve our problems on our own in unique ways without trying to stall the engines of national government. Why do we have so much gridlock? Why is it that the world of Washington politics is filled with hate and malice? I would argue this occurs because when both parties believe exactly the same thing, the only thing left of that will separate them is the degree of meanness with which they treat each other. For those of us who are concerned about this situation, we have a grand opportunity to provide Americans real solutions to their problems. That we are not a country of Legos that can be easily broken down and remixed in a giant plastic bag only to be drawn out by children to build some grand new project. My children used to do that. They would build Legos when they were three, four, and five, and they were ugly. <laughs>
it didn't look very good. And often I wonder if the United States is not being made ugly by efforts to reimagine what we might be if we were just under someone else's control. <clears throat> Whether it is net neutrality, Obamacare, climate change, gay marriage, or any other controversial issue, rest assured that the cronies will agree on one thing. One thing. There must be a single national solution to our problems. That is the position that Americans are now willing to question. And we must be there to give them the right answers. Thank you.